The Mike Wallace Interview, presented by the American Broadcasting Company, in association with the Fund for the Republic, brings you a special television series discussing the problems of survival and freedom in America. Good evening, I'm Mike Wallace. In the last 12 weeks, we've been discussing many aspects of the free society and what it must do to survive. Our guest, Robert Hutchins, former dean of the Yale Law School, former president of the University of Chicago, now president of the Fund for the Republic. This is Robert Hutchins, a vigorous social critic, a great educator, a man who has helped to revolutionize our thinking on the role of education in America. His ideas continue to provoke debate when he says that despite all our talk, American education is still going down the drain. When he says that our Bill of Rights is not adequate to protect the individual in our modern society. When he talks about the role of religion in a free society. Mr. Hutchins, first of all, let me ask you this. As I've pointed out, we have been interviewing leaders in public life on the problems of survival and freedom, on the threats to the incursions into our freedoms. What do you think are the enemies of our freedom? I think the principal enemy of freedom is illusion. I think this series, in effect, shows that. What are the items in our life uh, described by these gentlemen are really illusions or not? That is what they are actually calling attention to. They're trying to call attention to things that they think are illusions. I gather that there are, or am I right when I suggest, that there are a set of so-called Hutchins illusions? Oh, I have a great many, yes. Well, then let's hear some of those illusions. But the, these are not my illusions that I'm about to talk about. It's the illusions that I think other people have. Mm -hmm. I would say that the great pervasive American illusion is uh, the illusion of the importance of size or quantity. I would say that the, there is the illusion of our technical superiority. There is the illusion that we don't have to think. And there is the illusion which is related to all these other illusions uh, of progress. May we take them one by one? Let's start with size or quantity. What do you mean about the illusion of size or quantity? Well, the illusion of size or quantity is that the bigger a thing is, the better it is. Uh, now, I don't think that this is American materialism, because I don't believe that Americans are as materialistic as Europeans are. I think this idea that uh, you count things or measure things and in that way tell how good they are is a result of laziness, and it's a result of the fact also that we're trying to keep the peace in a pluralistic society. We don't want to argue about anything important. So I said, well, we know that the Empire State Building is higher than the uh, Lincoln Building, and all you have to do, if you want to prove that, is to get out your tape measure and uh, run it up. This settles the argument, and we can go back to our, our peaceful pursuits. But you see this in almost every walk of life. You see it in education, for example. Uh, Santayana, George Santayana, tells about crossing the Harvard Yard in the 80s when he was teaching philosophy at Harvard, and he met President Elliot. And President Elliot said, don't tell me, Mr. Santayana, how are your classes going? And, uh, Sandy Anderson started to tell him about how bright his pupils were and uh, uh, all the interesting things that they were learning. And Sandy Anderson says, Elliot cut me off as though I was wasting his time and said, I mean, Mr. Sandy Anna, how many men have you in your classes? And, so, when we, and when we discuss education today, we do so in terms of money, numbers of students, numbers of buildings, and so on. I will come a little bit later to education specifically, but I think that we understand the illusion of size and quantity now. The second, I think, that you mentioned was that of our technical superiority. You don't really need to discuss that because that has been so obvious and so obviously exploded. We first thought that the Russians couldn't produce an atomic bomb. We then thought that they couldn't produce a hydrogen bomb. And we then thought that they couldn't send up a satellite. They've done all three. The third was that we don't have to think, the illusion that it's unnecessary for us to think. Yes, this is the real basis of the anti-intellectualism in the country. We're a group of practical people hacking out the continent, you know, and we're going to uh, develop all these material goods, which we're then going to count and measure. And if you can count, you don't have to think. This is the way in which you determine whether anything is good or bad. Now, of course, the real way to determine whether anything is good or bad in the practical order is to ask what it is you're trying to do. Then you measure your result in terms of your standard. But this requires thought. And the fourth illusion was that of progress. I would only say on the, on the, further on the other one that a celebrated the, uh, sociologist made a remark that always interested me. He said, if you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. Now, the illusion of progress? Yes. Well, the illusion of progress is perhaps uh, best illustrated by the story of the Burmese who attended a recent international convention. He said that uh, since his country was rather backward, he had no sex crimes to report. But they were being rapidly uh, industrialized, and he hoped that at the next meeting he might be able to do better. Here again, the question is, uh, what is the total effect of your social organization on your total society? And can you delude yourself into uh, pointing to your material accomplishments as a, as a measure of the society? If these are, if we accept these as at least four of our illusions, the illusions under which we currently labor in the United States, the question must follow, how did we get that way? Where did these illusions come from? Well, I think you, you, you get some light on that. If you think about what Thomas Jefferson's prescription for the successful republic uh, were, 
He said that there were four reasons why the American Republic was going to succeed, in spite of the fact that he thought it, such a form of government could not succeed in Europe. He said, first, we weren't going to live in cities. He said, second, we were all going to be self-employed. He said, third, that we were all going to participate in local government. And he said, fourth, that we were all going to be so well-educated that we could cope with any problems that confronted us. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, the first three of these, uh, I think, are not fulfilled to anybody's satisfaction. We know that most of us are employed by others. Uh, we know that most of us live in cities. Uh, nobody would suggest local government as a training ground for civic virtue, and I certainly would not suggest that we were so well-educated that we could cope with any problems that confront us. Now, it happens then that Jefferson's ideals seem to be valid. The ideals of the Founding Fathers seem to be valid. But how do they maintain their vitality when the facts to which they were applied have, entire, have been entirely altered? What happens is that we uh, hide behind the cliché curtain, the veil of slogans and illusions that separates us from reality. We go right on talking as though we were still in the 18th century. But the facts are quite different. Well, then what do you suggest that we do about it, Dr. Hutchins? Are you suggesting that we rewrite the Constitution set up by our Founding Fathers, that they simply do not understand the way the conditions that prevail today, and that we've got to really do something about it? Well, I yield to nobody in my admiration for the Founding Fathers. And I certainly yield to nobody in my admiration for the Constitution. But I think the conditions have so drastically altered, because the world has not only been industrialized, but it has also been polarized. Conditions then have so drastically altered and altered in such a dangerous way that we must be prepared to recognize, as the other men in this series have tried to suggest in the fields with which they have dealt, the difference between illusion and reality, the difference between a slogan and a principle, and the, the difference between the 18th century and the second half of the 20th. Well, you talk about the difference between illusion and reality. You talk about a cliché curtain. What I would like to understand is, why is it that I and so many of my fellow citizens are willing to buy illusion instead of reality? Why do we close our eyes to Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Wallace, as you are not the victim of any such sales talk. Well, I, I think that the reason for these illusions is that they are comfortable. Why do we, why do we say, for example, when the Americans, when we were able to drop an, Amer an atomic bomb, that the Russians would never be able to make one. A moment's reflection on the state of Russian science, on the state of secrecy affecting the uh, processes underlying this bomb, would have assured us, as all the scientists did assure us, that the atomic bomb would be produced by the Russians within five years. But if we had accepted that idea, it would have been extremely disagreeable. What is the way back? I'm, mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm probably searching for oversimplified answers here. But I think, in a sense, we must pigeonhole, because it is an aid to learning. What is the way back? I think the, the way back may be, and of course anybody who said he knew the way back would be presumptuous. I think the way back may be first to recognize that the situation has changed, something that we usually refuse to do. Uh, second, to try to identify the issues that these changes produce. Third, to try to clarify these issues and proceed by the method of democratic discussion to see if we can dis uh, invent a program of action. May I come to some specifics now, some other specifics? One of our illusions, I gather you feel, is that the Bill of Rights fully protects us against our government. But you have gone, you've gone so far as to say that the Bill of Rights cannot protect us adequately from some incursions by our government into freedom of thought and speech. Why not? The Bill of Rights was directed against the central government on behalf of the states, and with the adoption of the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court ultimately decided that certain sections of the Bill of Rights protect the citizen against the state government as well as against the federal government. But the, what I have had in mind is not merely the, the question of freedom of speech and thought. It's uh, much more general than that. The fact is that the federal government is an entirely different animal today from the government that existed in the, at the time of the adoption of the Bill of Rights. There is an infinite number of bureaus, all of whom regulate the life of the citizen in some respect, uh, some of the time. All you have to do to appreciate this is to, is to imagine the number of gov government agencies with which a small businessman has to deal every day of his life. Mm -hmm. Well, the remedy that is proposed by the Bill of Rights for any interference by the government with the life of the citizen is that, that he should go to law. Well, anybody who's ever gone to law uh, knows that this is an experience that you don't want to have more than once in your life, and you don't want to have it then if you can possibly avoid it. So this remedy is, for all practical purposes, useless. The small businessman can't uh, sue the government every time he has trouble about a license or every time he has trouble about his 
uh, unemployments or social security taxes or about his income tax every time he's, he thinks they've cheated him out of $41. It takes tremendous time. So you have, a, you have a totally new relationship that has developed between the individual and the central government without any comparable oration in the remedies that are available to him. Do you have a remedy to suggest? <laughs> no. The uh, remedies have been tried in other places, in other countries. We don't think of France as a political model precisely. But the Conseil d'Etat in France is an effort on the part of the French administration to protect the citizen against the administration. And the, the theory of it appears to be sound. Whether the practice works is another matter. The British are very much exercised about this subject. And Sir Oliver Franks was chairman of a royal commission a couple of years ago in which they attempted to work out their answers. My only point at the moment is that this situation has changed. That is an, it is an illusion to suppose that the citizen is protected as he once was against the government and that we ought to try to find out what to do about it. Talking about protecting the citizen against his government as we are, recently on this series, Cleveland industrialist Cyrus Eaton vigorously criticized certain government investigative agencies. What do you see as the social effect of this pub public criticism of highly regarded governmental agencies? Oh, I think Mr. Eaton was in the best American tradition. Um, there's, I don't know of any reason why any governmental agency should become a national icon or, with a, or why there should be a taboo on criticizing it. And do you feel that the press of the nation came sufficiently to his defense when he was subpoenaed by the House on American Activities Committee? Well, that was a masterly error that aroused the press all over the country, yes. Of course, one public institution that has come under fire from all sides recently is our education, our schools, particularly since Sputnik, as you pointed out. Now, from all this hue and cry about education, what do you think has been accomplished and will be accomplished as a result of this joke to our complacency? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. In spite of the slick magazines and the radio and television commentators and the newspaper editorials and all this, nothing. Why? Because our complacency hasn't been jolted. It has been uh, temporarily nudged. Why hasn't it been more than temporarily nudged? Well, you, you'll recognize that the American people are, no matter what they say, are really indifferent to education. They can get temporarily excited about it. They want their children to have the diplomas and the degrees that will admit them to certain occupations. But the American people are not serious about education. Well, I'd like to know why. You say the American people. Do you yeah. think that people from other countries oh, yeah. are more serious about oh, yeah. education? And what's wrong with us that we are not more serious? Well, the reason other people are serious about education in other countries is that in other countries, education is the only road to success. In Russia, it's a road to very brilliant success, or may be the road to such success. In Europe, this is true, though perhaps to a less extent than it is in Russia. But education has nothing to do with success in the United States. Uh, uh, a, a child of mine, I won't say a child of yours because of such a thought is impossible, but a child of mine who was just above the level of moron could, I'm sure, acquire the diplomas and certificates that were necessary to enable him to get a job and make a, a comfortable living. So why should, why should we get excited about education? You said, Mr. Hutchins, uh, and I quote you here, by definition, a moron is a person who cannot think, and one of the benefits conferred upon us by the Industrial Revolution is that it has made it possible for morons to be successful. This well, would you care to enlarge on that? Well, this is uh, perfectly obvious. The, the object of industrialization is to reduce the amount of human effort and intelligence that is put into any single operation. Therefore, the, you finally get machines down to the point where they can be operated by 12-year-old children, or it could be operated by them if the law would allow it. Uh, this means that it is possible for a moron to be successful. Now, uh, it, the, this, the, the horror of this situation is not in the fact that morons can be successful, something which I heartily applaud. The horror of the situation is that people who are not morons are doing work that morons could do. The assembly line is a, is a cramping, narrowing, non-human, anti-human industrial phenomenon. Are you suggesting that we thus to do away with our assembly line and do away with technological not progress? Not at all. I'm all for technological progress, and I would like to see it accelerated so that we got automation. And the, this might have the effect of releasing individuals from this subhuman labor that is really only transitory anyway, because the aim of industrialization is clearly to substitute at every point where it can be substituted a man for a machine or a mechanical process for a man. And therefore automation would free human beings to do what? It would free human beings to be human in a word. Let's come back specifically to education for a moment. You suggest that we change our rewards for the properly educated man and that thus we will upgrade education? Is that what we have to do to jolt our complacency? Really? I think, I think something of that sort is required. It's not too difficult to change the symbols of a culture. But, and I think this would have to be done if we were ever to get the kind of educational system that I should regard as at all satisfactory for a country of this type. 
But you have to provide the incentive in the culture that leads the family and the child and the environment to attach importance to intellectual achievement.